Tony winning, Tony winning director, Stephen Daldry. Uh, good evening. In 2015, over two million people sought refuge in Europe. They were part of the greatest migration of humanity the world has seen since the Second World War. People sought asylum in Hungary, in Germany, in France, and many people sought asylum in the Great Britain, which of the country of which I'm obviously from. They got stuck there. They came to France and realized there was the channel, and then they realized that the border with the United Kingdom, in fact, is not in the United Kingdom, but it's actually in northern France because of a treaty that England and France had called the Touquet Treaty. So your passports are checked in northern France. The thousands of people that were trying to get to the UK therefore got stuck, mostly in Calais, but also in Dunkirk, and a sprawling, appalling refugee camp emerged in northern France. It was without, I think I can honestly say, of all the refugee camps I've been to in the world, this was the most disgraceful given the fact it was only an hour away from King's Cross. As the humanitarian crisis continued to happen in 2015, two young British playwrights, Joe Murphy and Joe Robertson to my left, decided that they would go, first of all, to Europe to bear witness. They went to Calais, witnessed this refugee camp. They spent a week there and decided what they wanted to do was build a theater. They then spent the next seven months of their lives living in the refugee camp and building this theater. In order to, ex <laughs> the focus of this evening is to ask them why they did it and what they achieved and what they hope to achieve in the future. Before we get into discussing with them what, they were, what their aims and objectives are and were, I just want to show a short film which was made two years ago, because the, the theatre was built exactly two years ago, almost to the day, and we made a short film just after, they just put it up um, two years ago, and it's just a short introduction to their reactions to Calais and what they built um, in this refugee camp. But it was made with the help of a, of a few other the volunteers um, that they found working in the camp. So before we talk to the Joes, let's just have a look at this video of their first arrival, if you like, in Calais two years ago. Can we run the video? This is uh, the jungle. It's an unofficial uh, refugee and migrants camp. First came to the jungle in Calais two months ago. And we got towards the entrance and we saw Loads of bodies and loads of people. I didn't really have words for quite a long time. I walked with Joe for about a couple of hours and found the most incredible and at the same time most awful situation happening right here, an hour from Paris and an hour from King's Cross. The police and the government have allowed people to set up a shanty town and given them some incredibly basic services. But there aren't enough toilets, there aren't enough taps, there aren't any facilities for washing, there's no electricity. The only plumbing is flowing water. There's no drainage, there's no sewerage. What you have is, is a refugee camp where the living standards and the sanitary standards are below a lot of other refugee camps in the world, in you know, some of the poorest, most conflicted areas of the world. There are many, many different nationalities of people gathered here. Sudanese, Iraqi, Syrian, Iranian, Afghanistan, and more to the point, there's a sense of community. Um, despite differences um, of where people have come from. Horrible living conditions, a terrible situation for thousands of people, and at the same time, this incredible and amazing sense of hope and optimism and belief that something will be better in the future. Our impression of the people here and the situation was quite different to our preconceptions. We found that everyone wanted to talk and tell their yeah. stories. Yeah. And so we, we thought a space where people could do that, that would be safe for the winter and warm. We're currently in quite a strange theatre. We call it a theatre, but it serves many different purposes. 
It's across all art forms, and it's, it's sort of a town hall. On a really basic level, we have to have a place where we can reflect upon our situation. Sometimes churches can provide that, sometimes mosques can provide that. But this space is open to all, all nationalities, all genders. There is no judgment. It is completely open. You can sit, you can draw, you can write, you can talk, you can share, you can sing, you can dance. So we start the day early in the morning. We clean and sweep up, sweep everything out, and then we'll go into a writing workshop that will maybe last an hour and a half. In the evenings, we have rap battles and spoken word to um, poetry readings to a disco on a Saturday night. We've then had about two or three hours of an artist, Chav, who come, who's come in with blank canvases. People can come in and make that square their own. They're now all over the walls. People come in here all the time when it's more of an open space and when there's not structured workshops going on to play music and to sing. And I think that's what's so magical is that the basics of food and water and shelter are important, obviously, but you have to go beyond that and let people have a space where they can be human, where they can laugh, where they can be positive, where they can be happy, where they can forget about where they are. Didn't really expect to end up in a theatre. I didn't come here to do artsy-fartsy bollocks. I came here to fix stuff, <laughs> and I built a house, I helped build a school. Um, the stuff I've seen going on here is beyond, beyond my capacity to, to explain or to describe. The need for expression and the need to view yourself in a slightly different way, from a different angle, to, to come to terms with, with who you are, why you might be here, that is as important as food and shelter. There is no easy solution to this question. And all we're trying to do here in this space is try and communicate the humanity that exists here. <laughs> The experience of art, of any level of art, is that it allows people to relax and it takes them away from the sense of where they are into a, a separate space. And although there's been a lot of happiness in this place, there's also a great deal of sadness. The only thing people need here, apart from a massive political shift, is houses and hope, and this is a massive beacon of hope, really. We built it here with the help of about 100 people throughout the day just coming and yeah. you build from the top and then sort of do layer by layer. And by the end, you know, you have to have people all around the structure pushing it upwards yeah. till, it's, till it's as high as it is, yeah. it is now. Everyone being involved, right from the start, it's been, it's been owned sort of communally by the community here. Um, that's really important to say, is that this isn't, this isn't owned by us. The reason that, that, that so many people come at night and during the day and filter in and out and feel safe in this place, because it's theirs. Uh, there's no reason in the world that we couldn't put up a theatre here and that people here wouldn't love that. And that was sort of the, just the idea behind the Good Chance space, a space where people could tell their stories safely and warmly and openly. Uh, so the first question I'm going to ask you is, is, you refer to it in the film, but I'm just going to ask you just again, why build a theatre in a refugee camp? It, it does seem like the most silly idea, because I think in lots of different countries all around the world, we have this notion that there is life and then there is art, 
and that for people who are struggling in their life and they perhaps don't have a house or they don't have food or they don't have safe water to drink, that art is somehow a lot further away. It's not part of their life. Our idea is that that isn't true, that actually life and art are the same thing. And that when art is close to life, <laughs> come on, come on, come on. <laughs> when, when art is close to life, it makes life better, is the basic idea. Yeah, my answer is expression is a human right. And you know, a, a, a lot of us are lucky enough to enjoy that right every time we post a tweet or, or go on Facebook or watch a play at the theater or a, a program on the television. Mm -hmm. And if we really believe it's a human right, then, then we have to make that so in places where it's under threat. And I think the experience of a refugee is one of dislocation and a loss of narrative. Art can restore, can restore culture and language, and it can allow people to rebuild narratives and create new ones. We, sh we should say one thing, actually, which is that you could call it a different thing. Um, it, if you were a different person, you might not call it a theatre. Um, it was, we called it a theatre because we're playwrights, um, and so we come from the theatre, and, but really it was a town hall. Um, for some people, it was like a leisure centre, and you'd have exercise classes in the morning, uh, for children, it was like a playroom. It served lots of different functions. And I suppose for some people, it was, um, it was like a place to pray, um, a place where people gathered um, to be calm. Um, so a theatre, yes, in a refugee camp. There's many different nationalities in the refugee camp. I think you mentioned there's 25 different nationalities. Mm. I think I'm right in saying it's the only place in the camp where all the different nationalities felt safe to be together. Because it was quite segregated. There were people from Kuwait. I mean, you must say, there's people from all over the world, yeah? There were, uh, the dominant nationalities were Sudanese people, um, people from Afghanistan. Uh, there were Syrian people there. Iranians, Iraqis, Palestinians, Somalis, Kuwaitis. I mean, it was, it, it was a, a, a map of the Middle East and North Africa, as well as lots of people from Peckham and, uh, and uh, Lille and Paris and everywhere else in between. It was a little microcosm of the world. And <laughs> you'd walk from Sudan to Afghanistan. You'd say, well, I'll see you in Egypt. And, you know, it would take you five minutes and you wouldn't need to show your passport. Uh, it, it, but there were, it, it wasn't segregated. But people live stuck together. You know, they've traveled all that distance and you'd live with who you know and the languages that you speak. It's natural. So I suppose we conceived of a space where, the one space where everyone could come together, where I everyone was welcome and where actually that was the point. I suppose my question is, it's, I can imagine it being quite hard as, as young, young people, managing quite complex cultural and social uh, conflicts within, within the jungle within the refugee camp. How did you manage to get it to be a place that everybody was welcome, both children, women, and indeed uh, very people who in their own regions might be at war with each other? I think that's about creating an atmosphere of welcome, which I think is not just when you're building a theater in a refugee camp, but it's, it's in, every, in every walk of life, whether you run a, a business or a, a different kind of organization or in a school, you have to foster an atmosphere of welcome, and that for us involved a handshake, whenever someone walked through the door, uh, you didn't have to tell your story. You could sit and watch. You could join in if you wanted to. It's sometimes the Afghan boys would want to put the flag right above, uh, right above the entrance, and you'd say, no, no, this space is for everyone. But I think it wasn't just us. The communities understood that as well, and mm. they defended its neutrality as much as, as we did, I think. Mm. You mentioned stories. Why is storytelling, why is it important for refugees or for people traveling from different parts of the world having been through such trauma why is it important to tell stories to each other and why is it important to tell it to other people around the world simply well i mean we very <laughs> do that one <laughs> i think it's the most basic basic thing that we do after kind of putting food in our mouths or you know having a glass of water or whatever we we speak to each other we're social animals right and Sometimes we don't know the reasons that we tell those stories or speak to each other, but it happens. And over the course of history, we've worked out really good ways of 
telling those stories and doing it so that it makes other people laugh or whatever. And the point of our space and our space is, is that people who are refugees, who don't have the space or the time or the, they're under such pressure in their lives that they can't tell their stories, they can come to our places and they can tell their stories. But I think as well, a story, a story takes so many forms and the many nationalities we continue to work with come from the most incredible artistic traditions, yeah. cultural traditions, Sudanese djembe and Eritrean song and Iranian stand-up comedy. You know, I remember a chap called Mizba from Afghanistan who was deaf and he entered the theater a few months after we'd opened it <coughs> and created in that space this tradition of mime that he would create these 45-minute movement pieces and there'd be 350 people crammed into the space watching in total silence him narrate through body and face in the most precise and expressive way his story as a child soldier in Afghanistan, his journey, his arrival, and then a sort of future hope. And you could hear people whispering, oh, that's what's, that's what's happening. Yeah, he's yeah. crossing this, he's going through there. You know, the stories that, that you know, we still are surrounded by take so many forms. And the importance of telling them, of, of owning that story is, is massive, I think. Having made the, I mean, I'm interested in the story because it, it, it's obviously, this conference is about young people making a difference and young people doing extraordinary things. And you went to a refugee camp which you hadn't been to before. You built a theater which you hadn't done before. You ran a theater you'd never done before. And then you started a series of very complex cultural negotiations. And then you started a negotiation with different NGOs. No, I'm sorry. I've, can I say one thing about this? Right, last night, with the greatest, greatest of respect, um, so Bob Geldof very specifically addressed us as ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're not ladies and gentlemen. We're boys and girls. <laughs> and the reason that that is a good thing... No, no, bear with me. The reason that that is a good thing is because we're naive. And if we're naive, actually it means that we go to places without <coughs> necessarily knowing that we can make a difference or that we know how to make a difference. We just go there. We just do the thing. And then we find out as we're doing it. So I think sat somewhere beneath that question is this kind of, there's a mystery about going into places where you don't understand. But every, everyone yeah. here is, is going out and doing those yeah. things. Naivety has a bad press. And I think we've got to <laughs> reclaim it. Because it's the source of all invention and it will be the source of our salvation. Come on. Naivety. <laughs> But you did start quite extraordinary relationships with some of the major NGO organizations working in, in camps around the world. You, the United Nations High Commission of Refugees was not working in this camp. It was allowed by the authorities. You did start a relationship with Medicine Sans Frontier and other... Um, yeah. uh, what was their take? I mean, I, I know this, but I want you to talk about it. What was their take on, on this? Did they think it was important? Well, what are the other really experienced... NGOs working in refugee camps around the world. What was their reaction to you? Um, I, I suppose the way that they thought it, about it was a kind of um, therapy. Um, we don't necessarily talk about it in that way because we think art is a much more primal thing. Um, but it did definitely have a therapeutic yeah, it, benefit. It, it does. And they recognised for the mental illness in the camp, which was huge, as you can imagine, in, in situations where it wasn't life-threatening, the, the antidote was well, they sent people to the theatre. They said, go, talk to people, express mm. yourself, tell a story, write a poem. And we saw people, people's frame of mind change over the weeks that they were in. And that continues to this day. We're working with MIU Solidarité in Paris, where we've built a theatre earlier this year. And for them as well, it's, our theatre is a place where people can come together, where tensions reduce and where the process of newly arrived refugees and local people can come together in a space that's artistic, that's peaceful, that's warm and start to get to know one another, which is, I think, the great challenge that we face now. Yeah. The, um, I'm aware that the, 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 the model of this theatre that you have in this refugee camp the Calais refugee camp was taken down by the French authorities, but you've been invited around the world to, to speak about your experiences, but also to build, to build more. I'm changing my... 
Uh, okay, thank you. To build more refuge, build more of your theatres in Athens, in Berlin, uh, in Beirut, and other places around the world. Can you can you just tell us a little bit about what your plans are for the future? Because yeah, just tell us a little bit more about what your plans are. Uh, well, I mean, we think really strongly that in a difficult situation like Calais or in other difficult situations around the world where food is vital, where shelter is vital, art is vital too. And you need that space where people can reflect and confront what they're going through and where the stories in that place can be communicated to a wider audience. It's so important. Can I just try and do one thing? So on a very basic level, um, these are places where people are going to come together to get to know one another, and they might be places of conflict or great difficulty. Um, anybody who thinks that that kind of space might be relevant to the place that they've come from, can you please stand up now? <laughs> come on. Lots. Okay. It's a lot. It's yeah, if it's a, a town or a, a city where it's communities aren't talking to each other, <laughs> Or it's a place where... Keep standing if you've stood up. <laughs> Don't change your mind. Okay, this is going somewhere. We Everyone stood up. We want to talk to you after this, okay? Because this is something that is going to go all around the world. It's something that we feel is absolutely <laughs> vital. And while we're here in Bogota, we may as well do it now. Okay? Yeah. So we're going to... Well, after this, we'll go to the toilet... Um, and stuff, but come and find us after that, okay? <laughs> yeah. Because what the Joes do, they build theatres of hope, and what they're looking for is partners. Can I just ask you one, I just, there's a, a question which I'm sure many of you will be asking, or at the back of your mind. Where do you, where do you get the cash from? Well, we started, a, we passed the hat around our friends to start with and bought our dome off the second-hand dome website, curlew.co.uk. Um, but then we started to crowdfund on Just Giving, and we raised, I think, well, we raised a huge amount of money. It's the second most successful crowdfunding campaign of yeah. all time, apparently. There you go. Anyway, we <laughs> now raise <laughs> shameless self-promotion. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. A, a variety now of crowdfunding, of private individuals, trusts and foundations, and yeah, that's... that's I'm pleased you mentioned crowdfunding. Many of you here work on... Uh, platforms and uh, on the social network that, that actually when, we, when the Jews do talk about building it does usually come from crowdfunding it comes from people accessing people who give small amounts some people give large amounts but most people give small amounts uh, the reason I want you to check out their website and I want you to go and meet them if you can or Naomi Webb their executive director who's in the audience where are you there she is Naomi just stand up Naomi so everybody knows where you are there's Naomi Woo. It's, Woo. <laughs> I want you to, to put them on your website. So I want you to talk to them and because we need honesty to raise more money as we do build these theatres, hopefully in places that you come from around the world. Yep. Um, we're going to have to wrap up. I just wanted to say um, I'm just... I'm in agreement with uh, Bob Geldof. I'm, I'm not particularly interested in flags. Um, but one of the things I really am angry about is people talk about refugees and they talk about them as terrorists, and I'm fed up with that. And I'm fed up about talking, people talking about refugees as migrants. <clears throat> In the end, everybody deserves a good chance, and these chaps are the Good Chance Theatre. So thank oh, you very thank much. You. Thanks very much. And thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.